this photograph, they'll definitely need a copy of this because what we found when we use this question with students is that they really want to start chopping up the picture maybe counting in rows, counting in boxes. I mean, give them tracing paper if you, want them to, if you want to be able to use the photograph again. And this photograph is starting to lead into the next section, which is where students are beginning to count squares in a grid and looking at different ways of doing that. Quite interesting. They'll come up with ideas you hadn't thought of yourself here. It's quite powerful, that question. Right, so now we go back to a context, and this context is tiling a bathroom. And you might think, question 16 A and B, find all possible rectangles that can be made out of 24 tiles. You might think this part B is a bit of an odd question to be asking, which one do you like best for the bathroom? But one of the features of this work is we start with a context, we get some maths out of it, but then we go back to the context. You know, we're not just, it's not, we're not playing at context here, it's not a pseudo context, it's not a camouflage for the mathematics. We actually are still thinking in terms of this context, and hence, which one do you like for your bathroom? And you may find your students start to talk about their bathrooms and what tiles they've got in their showers. And our teachers in the initial stages resisted that. They felt like this is wasting time, we're talking about context, but, you know, people are getting completely off the point here. But actually, the more the teachers worked with the resources, the more they felt it was particularly powerful to talk about context and let the students run with the context. Because in doing that, they're making connections between the maths and what's around them, their real life. It's quite possible the next time one of them stands in the shower that's covered in mosaic towels, they might actually start thinking about counting those tiles. So we found bringing context into the classroom and their experiences was a, quite a powerful thing to be doing. Although as a teacher, I think you naturally resist that to start with. And again here, we've got more tiles, real tiles, and we're counting. We're thinking about how they would fit into the wall of tiles. And again, students will probably approach that in, in a range of ways. Similarly with the questions on worksheet A2, which is a little bit more practice here, about counting tiles. And again, this is a case where you might want the colour version, because they are being asked to count total tiles and count the colours of various tiles. And again, they will approach this in different ways, so it's worth showing some strategies there. Right, question 21. This is one of the most important parts of this section, I would say. On a copy of this plan, or using tracing paper, find two ways to count the number of tiles needed. So, deliberately, the measurements aren't put on here, and students will count. And they'll count and hopefully get 19 across and 17 down. What they do next is really interesting. Some of them will continue to count in rows. So they'll count 19 with another 19 and another 19 and another 19. They've been told to count. That's what they'll do. Now, it particularly asks for two different ways. So it is quite possible, having done that first counting in rows of 19, that they'll review that and maybe start to chop it up. And what some of them do is they start to count in rows of 10. So they would be counting in 10s, 20, 30, 40, and maybe carry right on down counting in rows of 10, and then count in rows of 9. And they might have clever ways of doing that. Count in rows of 10, knock the one off. They might just happily count in rows of 9. In fact, depends what the ability of the students are. Some of them number every square. Some of them number just the n squares. And then you will have students who count 19 across, 17 down, and then on the side of the page do a little calculation, quite possibly the grid method. And they will do 19 times 17 and they will come up with an answer. Now one really interesting question to be asking those students is, where are these numbers in their grid on this tiled wall? You know, if they've done it 10 by 10, where's this 100 on this tiled wall? And one thing that still surprises me is that they will then start off, some of them will start to show you this 100, but they won't show it you in the place that you think it is here, 10 by 10 here. They'll show it you by counting in rows of 19 until they get to 100, so that they create something that's like an L shape. And one thing we've started to notice is that students have this grid method, but for them it bears no relation to counting squares in a grid. And in fact, we've worked with a number of teachers who, when we've come to get them to do this question, have suddenly gone, oh, right, that's where the grid method comes from. So when I said this is important, this section, it's fascinating that how it reveals that and how it enables students to start to make that connection. 
that possibly we think is obvious. So again, sketch a rectangular wall 17 across, 14 up, find a way to count the tiles by splitting the wall up. And there really is wor it, there's really worth time spent on this. What are the different ways of doing it? Will we get the same answer if we do it in different ways? You know, if you start to count in rows of five, do you get the same answer? And again, some students don't think you will. So, case step 22C here, what's the easiest way to split up the rectangle? This is interesting here now, because I think it's worth hearing what they say, and they'll have different ideas about what's easy, but also it's worth having one idea on, perhaps we are going towards this grid method, and maybe we might want to be chunking up in tens. And now this is, to, this is really pushing that relationship. Here's a tiled wall. We can't see the squares, but it can help us to count 25 lots of 24, or 24 lots of 25. And here's a way to do it. And I think this is a situation where we're now going slightly away from the context. The tiles aren't drawn in there, but it might be worth you as a teacher asking questions that still help them think in terms of tiles. You know, what does this wall look like? Where are the tiles? What does this 20 mean? We've got 400 here. What, there'd be 400 tiles if you drew them all in? Would there? Are you sure? They may seem like obvious questions, but actually they're quite revealing in terms of how students are thinking. And again, we've got some problems, a little bit of practice, but the emphasis again is comparing your solutions and your drawings with those of your classmates. Because when it gets to 24B, they have to make their own drawings to calculate 16 times 26. And it may be that they don't want to chop it up in the 10 and the 20 blocks. You may even ask them to do it a different way and see if they get the same answer. And if you're working with weak students, you know, there may still be, it may still be important for them to be on squared paper. This leap from the squared grid where they can actually count and they can see the squares to this representation of it here, which is actually a scaled representation, it's not an obvious one and it's, it's worth working on. And I think what we often tend to do in this country is we don't even go to this scaled representation, we just make the boxes look equal. So why would they think it represents squares on a grid? So it is worth working on that connection.